We were in here on Friday, and we had a beautiful Good Friday service. How many of you were here for that on Friday? Gosh, was that nice. I love our Good Friday service. I love the symbolism. Uh, some of you, if you were here, you got to take home uh, an olive branch for your, for your home to remember, and we had grapes and we had olives here because we wanted to remember not only this, the story, we read so much scripture, we want to be as complete as possible, and we didn't even read it all. There was a lot, but we remembered the crushing that Jesus took, both in the, in the garden and at the hands of the Roman soldiers. He took a crushing, and then he came to the cross and finished it. And then three days later, he walked out of that tomb alive. Happy Resurrection Day, everybody. My goodness. Great songs to remind us. We're blessed. Thank you, worship team, for all that. We rejoice that we are saved from the eternal bonds of sin and death through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, our Messiah. And that's why we come here every year to celebrate this, to remember, as you know, and I try to keep this in front of us quite often, that the act of remembering is so important to us as believers. We come here, and that's oftentimes why we do the same thing year after year, because we are called to remember. And so today, though we are resurrection people, we live in the reality of the resurrection, we come here on a day like today to remember remember the empty tomb and to, to talk about the resurrection and to, to put it out there even more. And I love this verse in Revelation chapter 1 verse 18. Jesus is speaking to John on the island of Padmas and, and John is receiving these words from Jesus and Jesus says, I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys to death and Hades. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today. We rejoice together today. We love you. We thank you. God, we come into this place, all of us here, our children included, today to remember what it is that you did. Father, we have life because you allowed death to come to your son. You allowed this sacrifice of your son. And because he is alive, we are alive. And we just thank you and rejoice in that today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So the kids are with us, like I said. We are glad you're here, little ones, with us. The, the kids who are normally upstairs are in with us today. If you didn't get a goodie bag and all of that, Miss Christy uh, spent some time and put some stuff for you today. She's not here this morning because, unfortunately, she's just not feeling well. So she didn't want to be here uh, around everyone to get you sick, too. But uh, I'm really bummed because there's only a few Sundays that I even get to see her sitting in the front row. So we're just uh, keep her in your prayers today that, that she's feeling better. But we want to just welcome all of you. If you're visiting with us today, we're glad that you're here. If, you, uh, if you're able to let us know, we've got some uh, communication cards, some connect cards that you can fill us out and let us know that you're visiting with us today. Or you can go online. It says there's a, there's a spot if you scroll down. If you're visiting with us today, you can let us know that you're here. Otherwise, we'd love to see you on the way out to give you a, a handshake, a high five, or a hug just to thank you for spending your Easter Sunday, your resurrection day with us right here. And just as all four Gospels talk about Palm Sunday, the, the Palm Sunday narrative, they talk about the crucifixion narrative, they also talk about the resurrection narrative. And I want to remind you that what we're going to read here, and I'm going to read a bunch, but what we're going to read here is absolutely true. If these are scriptures that you're not familiar with or you're not used to hearing, then I'm going to pray right now that there would be a spirit of faith in, in a open ears and open heart and mind to receive these words as God's absolute truth. Amen? I pray for salvation in this place today. 
I pray that, that those who have been far from God would run back to him today, would run back to the cross today. Amen? Amen. This is a great day to do that. So I want to remind you that it's true. This is the gospel, friends. This is what we believe. This is our ministry. This is our message. And I love this too, what the Apostle Paul told to the church in Corinth. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going to read two parts of this. But he said, if there's no resurrection of the dead, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, which is just another way of those who have died. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. And we rejoice in that today. We're going to do a lot of rejoicing today. We're going to honor God with the reading of, of the scripture. And I want to explain something to you. And I don't know if I've ever said this before, but I think it's important to say, especially in a day and age where there's so much contentiousness about the gospel. But sometimes you'll read through the, the stories, especially the resurrection story. And you'll see that, wow, why is there such a difference in these four narratives, when you read through it, you would think, wow, they, they should be all the same, right? Well, they're all talking about the same thing, and some might argue, well, there's a contradiction here. Here's what I want to tell you. There's no contradiction here. There's, there's something that is, uh, is important to understand. The gospel writers each wrote the narrative from their perspective, from a perspective that they had to, but they were all writing about the same thing. The fact that they aren't exactly identical, and listen to this, actually lends credibility to their truthfulness. And I'll tell you why. Because if you know anything about interrogators and the work that they do, and if you want to see how people have, have come together to corroborate a story, these interrogators will often hear key words, all the same stuff, and it all sounds like the same story, even though this person was over here, this one was over here, this one was over here, and this one was over here, they all saw the same exact thing. Well, that is a tip off to them that maybe the story isn't true. But when interrogators look at the gospel, this lines up for them. They say, this is normal, this is uh, something to be expected. And so when somebody comes to you and says, yeah, but they're not even all the same, and you can explain to them, they're just four different perspectives of the same exact event. And this is going to be true. When you hear what I'm saying today, when I'm reading, you're going to say, okay, some details were left out of each other's story, but now you know why. So I want you to be encouraged I want you to be able to respond to the, uh, to the accusations of inconsistency or contradiction. Those are, those are things that I just think it's important for you to grab a hold of today. In the scriptures, these are the real testimonies of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're going to start in Mark chapter 16. And again, like I said on Friday, I want you to put all of your senses here. I want you to see this as uh, something, it, it's obviously true, but could you put some of the smell, some of the texture, some of the feeling and the emotion and the humanity into all of this? It says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on, the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? What was the first day of the week? It was today. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. 
He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples, and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. In John chapter 20, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I, I don't know where they have put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. In Luke 24, and when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. That word, it could be like this, it seemed silly to them. Can you imagine that? Jesus has already been talking about this. He told them what was going to happen. And they didn't hold on to that. So when they were telling them, it seemed silly to them. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. And bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. John chapter 20. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb, and he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Matthew 28. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. In Luke 24, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost, and said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. 
but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Does anybody know what Jesus would send that was promised? He would send the Holy Spirit, and we will, in the weeks to come, we will be talking more about the Holy Spirit. On Resurrection Day, we remember the power of God over death and the grave. And this is key. This is vital to our faith and what we believe. And just as Paul told to the church in Corinth, if Jesus didn't really rise, then there is no resurrection, and there is no resurrection from the dead, then all of this is for nothing. I believe with all my heart that what the gospel story said is absolutely true, and I know so do most of you, and we live our lives according to this truth. Amen? Amen. So we've been talking a lot about testimony, and what I'm going to do, and I'm going to come back to, to my message here in a minute, I'm going to pause here, but I've asked Jody Cowden to come and to share a, uh, a fun, a, a powerful resurrection, uh, resurrection testimony, a true story, as she's going to tell you about, and then I'll be back to share five things with you. So give your attention to Jody. I want to start by reading Matthew 11, 25 through 27. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is your good pleasure. For all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. The Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Years ago, I worked as a special education teacher in an elementary self-contained classroom. Before that, I worked as a play therapist in a counseling agency. While I was at this agency, a five-year-old boy was brought to me by his mother for counseling. I'll call him Tommy. He'd been in kindergarten for only a month and was having serious behavior problems. He was already had a difficult life and his mom was doing all she could to meet his needs. By the second session, it was evident that he was suicidal. He had a very clear plan and the ability and desire to carry out the plan, so he was hospitalized. Over the next few years, he went through various treatment facilities and then came to my special education class as a fourth grader. He was still a very troubled little boy. He used to tell me about his struggle with evil that he believed gave him power and how he knew God didn't love him and would never let him go to heaven because of all the really bad things he had done. I responded by telling him about God's love and forgiveness and how the power of good is stronger than the power of evil. He didn't believe that stuff. He didn't know much about Jesus. So I told him how Jesus died on the cross because he loves us. And then he rose from the dead to prove the power of his love is greater than the devil's power to hurt people. I explained in terms he could understand that Jesus beat up the devil and won. So we can go to heaven if we know Jesus. But to Tommy, that was just an interesting story. The school year progressed and Easter approached. The church I was attending was putting on the passion play and I handed out invitations at school to anyone interested in a free show. Tommy came with his mom and his sister and sat with me about the fourth row from the front near the tomb. He had some impulse control problems and anger management issues, so I wasn't sure he would make it through the performance. But as soon as the children, animals, and Jesus walked into the sanctuary, Tommy was spellbound. Jesus was holding a young child and surrounded by children and happy people waving palm branches. To Tommy, Jesus looked like a pretty cool dude who was really popular and liked kids. Then as Jesus met with his disciples for the Last Supper, he looked like a really nice man who had a bunch of good friends. Tommy had never had a real friend. While Jesus and his disciples were in the garden, the music changed. The lights dimmed. The soldiers stormed in and Jesus was arrested. 
Tommy yelled out, knock it off, leave him alone. I had to move the mic so you don't. I had to block him from running into the aisle and up on stage to defend Jesus. As I held his shoulders, I whispered in his ear, it's okay, just watch and see what happens. As they took Jesus away to be tried by Pilate, Tommy climbed up on my lap and gripped the pew in front of us with a white knuckle death grip. He watched Jesus as the soldiers beat him. Tommy was breathing really heavy and I could feel his outrage as his eyes were glued to the scene. To him, this was all very real. Then they nailed Jesus to the cross. Tommy said with his teeth clenched, Make him stop! I whispered as I held him on my lap. It's okay. Jesus could make them stop if he wanted to, but he wants to die for us. We did bad stuff, so we should die up there, but he's taking our place instead. But it's not fair, Tommy said in anger. I replied, trying to sound positive. It's not over, though. Just watch and see what happens next. It was dark and scary as Jesus yelled in pain and then died. They took him off the cross and laid him in the tomb. The stone was rolled into place, sealing Jesus inside. The women cried. Tommy watched in shocked silence, confused, I'm sure, about why they would kill such a nice man. Then the music changed again and thunder shook the auditorium as the angel appeared over the stone. As the Roman guards fell to the ground, Tommy said triumphantly, cool. He was obviously pleased the angel was getting revenge on the bad guys. As the thunder rumbled, the stone slowly rolled away from the tomb and a bright light shone out from inside. Then Jesus appeared fully alive and stepped out of the tomb. Tommy jumped to his feet, thrust his fist in the air and loudly yelled, yes, way to go, Jesus. (laughs) At that moment, something happened that's hard for me to explain. I sensed that I was no longer looking at an actor in costume, but I was seeing the real Jesus, the resurrected Lord. It was like he decided to once again reveal himself on earth. And he was standing right there, just a few feet in front of us. There were hundreds of people in the audience, but he raised his arms and looked right at Tommy. I think his sole purpose was to show one very lost little boy that his story is not just any story. It's the truth. God is more powerful than evil. He forgives all the bad things we've ever done. His love even conquers death. Jesus beamed a radiant smile at Tommy, and Tommy smiled back, his fist raised in victory. And my heart shouted with him, yes, way to go, Jesus. And once again, I am sure Jesus is saying right now, right here today, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you again are revealing the truth of your love and your power to your children. Yes, Father, for this is your good pleasure. Cool. (laughs) That's awesome. Thank you for that. And you know what? Did you catch that's a true story? That happened. And, And so how old is that young man now? He's in his 30s. He's in his 30s now. And uh, we pray that he's walking with the Lord and that that is uh, an image that he has ingrained in his mind. And I know that some of you in, in my life too, I've spent a lot of years doing drama ministry and, and having those, even though you're replaying something and doing your best, I know that for many people, it was very real to see Jesus on the cross and very real to see him resurrected and um, there was once even at, at one of the uh, presentations that we did, there was a young Muslim girl who was sitting in the front and she had her head covering on. And at the end of it all, she came up to me and, 
and she had been taught all of her life, and this, this was her words, that that wasn't real. And she sat there because she was invited by a friend. She came out of honor and respect for that person for that invitation. And she looked at me, and she was about this tall. And she said, that was real. I saw him. It was real to me. And I said, because it is real. And I prayed with her to receive Jesus right there. And I said, you're free. And she removed this from off her head. It was so powerful. And my prayer today is that you see Jesus and his love for you so real. And that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you take it very personally because it was personal. It was for you. Amen? Thank you, Jody, for that. that was, that's a marvelous, marvelous story. There's five things that I want to want you to keep in mind on this resurrection day. And I want you to see all of these things as absolute positives, as privileges of the faith, that it's an honor to believe in and follow the resurrected Christ. Amen? And, and so the, the first thing of these five is to keep in mind, as you walk out your faith, as you share your faith, because we've been talking about being gospelers, we've been talking about evangelism, we've been talking about living our faith, what we believe out loud for the world to see. The first thing is that your faith might be challenged. It could be challenged. The enemy of our souls wants us, wants you, wants others, everyone out there to be uncertain wants us to doubt in some way. And that began at the tomb. It began 2,000 years ago and is carried through. And, and that won't end until Jesus comes back. And when he comes back, I will make certain of this, that you know there will be no doubt. Amen? Amen. When you see the return of the Messiah, no one will doubt. And he will make sure of that. But any and every argument that could be used by the enemy to nullify the testimony of the gospel will be tried, and maybe it's been tried on you. Maybe it's been tried on those who you've shared the gospel with. But I want to read something to you to prevent the people from believing. In Matthew 28, we, we saw the report. Actually, we, we read about this, that the soldiers were paid to lie about the resurrection. And it says in the Bible that that lie has endured even to this day. And if you go to Israel or you go to where uh, the Jewish people are, you will know they still don't believe in that resurrection. That lie or the spirit of that lie is still being played out today. But do you know why so many people chose to believe and follow Jesus despite those lies? You want to know why? In Acts chapter 1 verse 3, it says that after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to them and gave many, and I highlighted this, convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. He continued his ministry. But I love that. When I was reading this, this, this last week, those two words, convincing proofs. This is what Jesus did. He rose and gave convincing proofs. None of us were there 2,000 years ago, obviously, but still today, like Tommy, we have our own convincing proofs that Jesus is real, that Jesus is alive, and that he's alive in us, and he is present in this place today. Amen? Amen. How many of you can say, and, and we, could, we could have testimonies galore, but you know that you know that you know because something has switched on in your life. You have had a convincing proof of the resurrected Christ in your life. Raise your hand. Look at that. So those of you who are marveling at this or wondering about this and wondering how can this be, all of these people, including myself and so many more that I know, have had a convincing proof that Jesus is alive today. And I'll take this even a step further. 
that there are many Jews and Muslims and, and those from other religions who are having dreams of the Messiah. You ever, anybody hear of those stories of people seeing a man in a white horse visit them in a vision or in their dreams? And that itself is a convincing proof Jesus will not be denied. Amen? Amen. He can be lied about. But there is coming a day he will return, and there will be more convincing proof. And then Paul, in his letter to the church in Corinth, he wrote this so that they would also believe the testimony of Jesus. And this was some years after, after all of these things had taken place. But he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8, he said, For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to Scripture. Why is it important to say according to Scripture? Because what they're referring to is these things were prophesied. They were foretold, and then Jesus came, and everything that was foretold had come to be. And there are still prophecies that were foretold who had, that have yet to, to come to be, and that will happen in his coming. But he said that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and to the twelve, and that after that, listen to this, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, and most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. What that means, if we slow down our read through this, that means that what Paul was talking about is that most of those 500 people are still alive at the time of this writing to be able to testify that they indeed saw Jesus alive. Can you believe that? Do you believe that? Yes. Say yes. yes. <laughs> You're like the, the disciples when they first got the news. What's going on? <laughs> Do you believe it? Yes. Yes. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, Paul says, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. It's recorded that Jesus appeared at least 10 times during the 40 days following his resurrection. That's just what was recorded. Can you imagine the resurrected Jesus? He didn't even need to sleep. He could stay up all night talking to people and walking around and saying, boo, you know, I mean. <laughs> but listen to this. He ate with them. He had them touch him and examine his scars. He breathed on them. He spoke with them, encouraged them. The amount of testimony that came right out of the resurrected Christ for those 40 days after his resurrection is enormous. I have no doubt that Jesus appeared in the flesh. That's resurrection. That's love. So your faith will be challenged. What you believe will be challenged. Number two, your faith will be tested. This wild and crazy thing about the resurrection that you believe, that you go and tell people, you know what, I believe Jesus is alive. He died and he rose again. I believe it. Are you kidding me? Your faith will be tested. The Pharisees and the religious, religious leaders wanted to put a stop then, right then, to the testimony of the disciples. They were jailed, sometimes beaten, sometimes even threatened with death. We're going to look at Acts chapter 5, verses 34 and 35 and 38 and 39. And I want to remind you, all of the Good Friday Scripture and all of the Scripture today is on the app. If you go to the Grow tab at the bottom, you will see a place where all of the sermon Scripture is, and you can have all of this. You can read it all. But it says, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people. I want to link something for you. Gamaliel was Paul's teacher, and he will reference Gamaliel later in the Scripture. But that's the same, same Gamaliel right there. He stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men, the disciples, those followers of Jesus, be put outside for a little while. He's just going to address the other teachers and elders of the law right there, face to face. 
And he addressed them. He said, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is, is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Amen. Boy, was he right. That was wisdom for all of them right there. And again, when you know that you know that you know that God is real and has called you to life in Jesus, your calling is from God, and it cannot and it will not be stopped. You might come up against opposition. You might come up against some persecution. But what God is doing cannot be stopped. Amen? Amen. Do you have that confidence today? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Do whatever he asks of you. Speak the truth about Jesus. Do you know what made the disciples resolute and unshakable in their message, able to withstand any level of persecution? Because Jesus was alive, and they knew it. That's the resurrection. That's love. In the end, most of them were martyred, and with joy, and the praises of Jesus on their lips. Be sure of it. Your faith will be challenged. It'll be tested. Your faith may even be mocked. That's number three. But I have a question for you. If you know the truth, does the mocking even matter? No. It shouldn't, right? It shouldn't. But sometimes in our flesh, it does. But I'm telling you something. I feel like I have the greatest privilege in this room to stand in front of all of you and encourage you in the faith. Because as I stand here and the words that I get to speak and the things that I study, the things that I write, when I know that I'm telling you the truth, it doesn't matter what happens to me. It doesn't matter what happens to us because what's coming off of this platform to your ears is the absolute truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he's alive. Amen. Amen. That's good news, folks. So imagine, and I, and I just shared this story a little bit, but imagine the mockery that the woman with the issue of blood may have endured while she was acting on her faith to touch the hem of Jesus' garment because she knew that there was healing in those wings, in the, in the hem, in the tassel, the seed seat. There might have been some, as she was moving forward, who said, were jeering at her and talking, trying to keep her away. And she was saying, no way. I'm getting in there, and I want to encourage you to have the same faith. I want to read a Messianic psalm to you right now. This is Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10. It says, I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. That's capital L-O-R-D, which is what? It's his name, is Yahweh. I will... Keep my eyes always on Yahweh. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one, some translations say holy one, see decay. That's a messianic psalm talks about the resurrection. It's one of the things that they believe, and that's resurrection. So you might be challenged and tested. You might even be mocked. But in that, be sure of this, your faith, number four, will be followed. Your personal relationship, your interaction with, your experience with, your testimony of Jesus, do you realize cannot be refuted? It's your testimony. It's your testimony. You might be challenged in all of those things, but you need to make up your mind right now that you'll be okay with that. Because I guarantee those disciples, when they first saw Jesus and they first started talking about him and they had the, all of that courage, there is no doubt that the enemy was pushing on them to stop telling that story. Stop saying that. But don't stop saying that. 
Make up your mind right now that you're going to be okay with the pushback. I can tell you I'm okay with it. I've taught my kids for years since they were little. If anybody comes for your dad, you don't need to fight for me. If they're coming because of my faith, that's okay. And I've shared this story before, but when Micah was little and we, we would talk about this and he, I don't remember how old, he was, he was pretty, pretty young, but he said, Dad, if anybody ever came for you, I would bust out this window and I would come and I would fight for you. Isn't that cute? <laughs> He'd bust right through the window, take on all the bad guys, save his dad. That's sweet. And I just said, Bud, you don't have to. If they come for me because of Jesus, I'm okay. I'll be okay. Amen. And I want you to know that too. Amen? Amen? The disciples counted it as a privilege to be persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. Do you, will you count it? And, and here, I'm talking about being challenged, tested, mockery, persecution, and I'm doing it with a smile on my face because it is a privilege. Do you count it and will you count it as a privilege to speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the real deal that it is? If they were willing to pay so high a price for following Jesus, I believe their testimony of Jesus must be true because I don't know anybody who would lay their life down for a lie. Amen? Amen. I believe their resolve to continue spreading the message of the gospel caused thousands upon thousands, and it multiplied, caused so many to find faith in Jesus. And here's the reality. You will see those thousands in eternity. You will see those thousands in heaven. You remember when we were talking about the jailer? Is that Acts 16, 17? Talking about the jailer with they, Paul and, and his companions, they were in the prison. And because Paul saw the need to share the truth of Jesus Christ, the resurrected one with the jailer, and the jailer accepted the testimony, you'll see the jailer in heaven. A Roman soldier, the jailer, will be in eternity because of Paul's faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we be so faithful, even at the hands of the pushback of the enemy. Amen. If you continue with your resolve in Jesus Christ, you will have others following you in the faith, and you will see those who followed you up there too. Jesus was dead. He was buried, and after three days, he was made alive. That is resurrection. Last year, I talked, one of the, the word I used, everybody remember the, the word I used last year for, uh, for alive, revive? Anybody remember? Tom, what is it? You know, you say it all the time. Hiya. That's right. Hiya. It means revive, it means alive, it means that is resurrection. And number five, the last thing, you will be resurrected because Jesus chose willingly to lay his life down in the garden. And do you realize it started before the cross? Jesus didn't wait to get to the cross to submit. He had been submitting the whole time, but when he was in the garden and he said, Father, not my will, but yours be done, he was submitting himself. And so may we do the same thing. Because he chose to be lifted up on the cross, because he chose to be laid dead in a tomb, and because his body saw life after three days, because he rose and walked out of that tomb, it's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead that his victory over sin, death, and the grave, that you and me and all in this place who choose to put their faith in him will live forever. Amen. We get to live forever. I would rather spend my eternity with God than an eternity separated from Him. And do you know what the difference between those two realities forever is? A confession of faith. 
believing and trusting that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. If you're watching this at home and you are just for some reason coming across this and you are somebody who doesn't have faith in Jesus Christ, profess it right there in your living room or wherever you are, wherever you're watching this and live, please. Jesus is real. Eternal life is real. What I feel inside of me right now is probably just a small fraction of what the apostles felt and those who were with Jesus felt, knowing, having actually seen him. I just believe it. They saw him. They touched him. They heard from him. Could you imagine the passion that they had because of the resurrected Christ? Man. We get to walk out of this place with that, friends. Even if you're challenged, even if you're tested, even if you're mocked, others will follow you as you follow Christ. And do you realize that there are some people who are going to test and pressure you because they want to see if it's actually real in you? They want to know, are they going to buckle or not? Is what I'm going to bring, the testing that I'm going to bring, I'm just going to have fun with them. I'm just going to see, are they going to back off from me? Are they going to buckle? Are they going to fall apart at a little opposition? Or are they going to hold it together? Are they going to stand in this? Stand, friends. You stand in it. Unashamed. In Romans chapter 6, 4 and 5. The Apostle Paul is speaking here and he says that we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly, that is absolute, certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Chaya. Here's the good news, friends. Jesus is alive. Amen. Right now. Here. In this place. In you. Right here. He's alive. The good news is that you're alive. And you get to live in that life and tell others that they can be alive too. That's resurrection. There are people, and throughout the generations and even in the age that we live in, that want to make a day like today about something it's not. We need to keep our eyes on the cross. Has anybody noticed there's no body on the cross? There's no body on the cross. There's no body in the tomb. There's no body in the grave now. We sang that song. What is that line? The, the hour of darkness is over. The hour of darkness is over. Thank you, Jesus. I want to just challenge anybody in this room right now. Hearing the gospel knowing that the Spirit is true, that Jesus indeed is alive, and that the only way to be with the Father forever in heaven is to profess that, is to put your faith in that. It is true. How do I know that I'm going to live forever? It's because I made this declaration and I live by it. Romans 10.9 it says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you made this declaration? There may be some in this room, because I don't know all of you. I don't know where you all are at in your faith, but I'm going to ask you, have you made this declaration? It says to declare it with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And so that means we have to utter the words, Jesus is Lord. But more than that, we have to believe in the resurrection. 
that God raised him from the dead because without the resurrection, there is no life. But Jesus is alive and he rose to life that we could be alive. Would you stand? In this place today, because I believe that there's salvation in this room, would you make a declaration out loud? Would you say, and maybe some of you will say this for the first time, Jesus is Lord. Would you say it out loud? Jesus is Lord. Say it again. Jesus is Lord. Say it like you want to testify to somebody out there. And maybe some of you, you're hearing others say it. I'm praying for the Holy Spirit. Would you help us, Lord, Spirit of truth, to have faith in this place, in these words, and in, in the only one who can lead us to the Father is Jesus through his resurrection. We say again, Jesus is Lord. And we make that declaration today, and I'm going to ask you this question. Do you believe in your heart? And when I say, ask the question, you can say, yes, I believe. Do you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead? Yes, I believe. Do you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Yes, I believe. Do you believe today that Jesus is no longer on the cross and he is no longer in the grave? Yes, I believe. Hallelujah. According to the word, if you made the profession that Jesus Christ is Lord, and if you believe in your heart the truth that he is no longer in the grave, that he is alive, that he is resurrected, then you are saved for eternity. Amen? Yes. If you made that declaration for the first time today, would you let somebody know? Would you let me know on your way out the door? You say, Pastor, I said it. I said it for the first time today because I want somebody to rejoice with you today. Amen. Amen. We've got some folks who, uh, who are willing to pray with you. If you guys would make your way to the, to the front, to the sides. If you want to let them know, I made this profession for the first time today. And here's the thing about that. There's no shame in this. This is a rejoicing matter. Amen. Amen. I don't want to coerce you. I don't want to coerce anybody to say those words, but I do want to try to convince you through the scripture because that's what the disciples, the apostles, and many evangelists have done throughout the years is to offer convincing proof that Jesus Christ is one true and living God. And I believe that he is the only way to the Father. There aren't many ways. There is one way. Amen. Amen. Say, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks on this resurrection day for the work that you did, the power of the cross, and the, the submission and obedience of your Son to put his body on that cross and to bear the marks, the wounds, Father, the deep trauma that he took in his own flesh for us, the blood of the Lamb that was shed. The lamb that was selected on last Sunday, the lamb who was crucified on a cross on Friday, and the lamb that rose from the dead on Sunday. Lord, we give you thanks and we rejoice in your holy and precious name. Amen.